The opinions expressed in the Brothers on Law Show are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for personal professional legal advice. Thanks for tuning in to Brothers on Law on Go Country 105. I'm Larry Mandel. And I'm Rob Mandel. And we've been trial attorneys here in Los Angeles for over 40 years. On our show, we will discuss current events, talk about legal issues, and have some very entertaining guests stop by. So stay tuned every week for Brothers on Law right here on Go Country 105. Good morning, everyone. I'm Larry Mandel. And I'm Rob Mandel. We are the Brothers on Law. Hey, Rob, how about uh, Debbie the Mortgage Mom? Love her. Yeah. Glad, glad we Good come stuff. right after her. Yeah. Hey, uh, Larry, do you remember when you um, first became a dad and you're changing your kid's diaper? You know, the, 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 you're doing, the wife says, hey, you know, it's your turn. And then you, you pull out the, the Johnson & Johnson baby powder and you're splashing that all over your kid. And maybe, you know, you're splashing it all over yourself. I after, overdid after, it. After a, after a shower, you know. Sure. And, and then, and then you know your wife's you know, using that stuff, and all of a sudden, you know, we, we learn this stuff can be deadly. Yeah, and because of the talc. Yeah, well, no, not the the. Is it the talc yeah, or is the it talc. the asbestos in there? Well, the well, asbestos in the within the talc. And okay. there's been these gigantic lawsuits with yeah. these big awards for for people who have had uh, cancers and whatnot related to. Um, uh, baby powder and this it's is a, talcum powder it's yeah. just crazy hey rob and that's a good segue to our special guest today chris that's right chris medek show and, and chris, uh, chris what is chris well chris is a uh toxic tort lawyer he's our good buddy and uh he's here with us today welcome to the show chris welcome chris and toxic tort lawyer what is that <laughs> hey, what does guys. that mean chris hey so uh difference between a toxic tort and a regular personal injury case is basically Personal injury, you know, you start on the outside and you get into a car wreck and uh, something injures your body and you see it immediately. In a toxic tort, it's inside out. You know, you ingest something, something goes into your body, the injury occurs inside. So like you have a respiratory illness in your lungs, it manifests itself from the inside out. Or cancers or blood cancers, leukemias, things like that, inside out. And that's just really the difference. That that is a really good distinction. I, that, yeah. that makes it very crystal clear. And uh, Larry and I do a little bit of that too. But you you pretty much um, uh, limit your practice to toxic torts, right? Right. Um, that's pretty much all I do. If you do these cases, um, that's all you have the energy and the time to do, really. So it's just yeah. how and it's what, had to be. And what kind of toxic tort cases do you handle? Typically, we've done. Um, lung cancer, mesothelioma, asbestosis, uh, leukemia, lymphoma, uh, respiratory diseases of all kinds. Tough stuff. And, and Rob mentioned the baby powder. You're handling cases with Johnson & Johnson and her so, things yeah, of that nature. Right. We're still looking at those cases, and I don't have any ongoing talc cases right now. We call them talc cases, but really they're asbestos cases. And talc, calling it a talc case is kind of playing into the game of the defendants. And um, it's a game that they've been playing for many decades. And right now it's having some pretty serious consequences on the, on the, the American consumer. So tell us why, why is it an asbestos case, you know, and, and linked to a talcum powder? So you mine talc, and that's where we begin. If anywhere you mine talc, you're going to have some veins of asbestos. Talc is a is is a mineral it's a rock asbestos is a mineral and they grow together in the same way in the same places and it's like peanut butter and jelly you know if you get one you're going to have the other it's just in a question of how much wow and so what what is asbestos and why is it so harmful um asbestos is a silicate fiber it grows in rocks um it has been known for millennia to be dangerous um pliny the elder was a I think the first guy to identify it as a carcin- well, something that could harm human beings, and that was like in 23 AD or so. Uh, Ramazzini, he was like the father of modern industrial hygiene. He's the guy that had the famous quote, quad artem exorcesias, which is, what do you do for a living? What hmm. do you do? If somebody comes in and they're sick, they ask, you're supposed to ask as an industrial hygienist, what do you do? And so it was known to these people way back in the day that asbestos could 
kill you. And it's been used because it has some pretty miraculous attributes, like King Charlemagne or Emperor Charlemagne, depending on where you come from. He had an asbestos cloth tablecloth, mm. and he would invite people into his uh, his you know in, into the dining hall. People and, he wanted to kill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. slowly. People yes. he want, Yeah, sometimes, but sometimes people he wanted to impress. Yeah. And so we would take the 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 tablecloth. They'd finish eating on it. He would take it, throw it in the fire. The fire would eat off whatever materials, food, whatever was on this tablecloth. Pull it back out. Put it back on the table. That was no his way kidding. of cleaning the tablecloth. Wow, that's but amazing. That's the, that's the miraculous quality that you were talking about. It's right. highly fire resistant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And what type of cancer does somebody get if they're exposed to asbestos? So that that's a really involved question. It will cause cancer to endothelial tissue. Right, wherever the endothelial tissue is, and wherever the asbestos goes, that's now, my what that, opinion. What is that in plain English? Endothelial tissue. What is that? It it lines like the the respiratory tract. Okay. Um, it gets in the lungs, and and it also causes cancer to something called the pleura of the lungs, which is the fluid. The fluid the, in your lungs. The, no, the pleura actually is like if you look at your lungs, like um, like like pulp, right? You you put. You, you, if you like fruit, you have the skin of the fruit and you have the pulp of the fruit. And the skin would be the pleura of the lungs. And the pulp of the fruit would be the actual lung tissue. And so asbestos is so small and so indestructible that it makes its way through all of the natural defenses of the human body into the lungs, through the trachea, the mucociliary escalator, uh, mucociliary escalator all these things, the, the, the hairs on the nose, can't all the stop way, it. You can't stop it. It's too small. It's too indestructible. Yeah. And because it's indestructible, your body tries to attack the the asbestos fibers so much that um, it eventually it'll it'll cause a cancer. Wow. And, and that's that's the decades. mesothelioma. When it reaches the pleura of the lungs, that's mesothelioma. Right? I see. And what? Why is it so? What is the quality of the fiber itself that makes it so destructive and so dangerous? That is an interesting chemical question. It's thought that it is the iron component of the uh, of the chemical formula of the fiber. That's okay. that's what's thought to be the the carcinogenic. The, yes. We're talking about a mechanistic question. Okay, and and that's a really profound. But Chris, but there's, I, there's I, asbestos still in our environment, right? I mean, in our housing and old buildings, and I know I had to have it removed in a, a house I I bought, which was an old house built in like in the 1940s. And they had to come in and do all this preventative stuff to get it out of there, right? That's true. And you still have, if you've ever sold a house or bought a house, you're going to look at an asbestos disclosure. And the people who sell you the home have to disclose whether they know that there's asbestos in the home. Very common. So, so I've heard that maybe and this is a um, not a, uh, a true thing that I heard, but... That True or false? Fi- yeah, <laughs> that the, I'm trying to spit it out here. That the fiber itself, even on a microscopic level, has like a hook on it, and it hooks onto your tissue, and so that's part of the reason why you, your body just can't get rid of it once it's in. That's crazy. One type of fiber does. That's called serpentine or chrysotile asbestos fiber. Has the hook that you're referring to. Okay. Others, the amphibole fibers are more like a needle. And they get in there, they lodge into, you know, some part of the inside of your body, some tissue somewhere. And when your body comes and tries to attack it to try to, you know, break it down and kill it, and it can't do it because it is indestructible. The same property for which we use it because it's indestructible, and your body can't destroy it either. Um, those that when it sticks in because it's a needle-like um, property in the actual fiber like an amphibole does, it's a little different from the hook like a crystallized asbestos fiber does, but the same result. Causes cancer. Yeah, Chris knows his stuff. He definitely now, how knows does that his stuff. Translate to when you, I guess, when you're using the talc powder, right. and it just has like this uh, powderly mist coming out from it, and that's enough to go in through your system. Right. So what you described is what's called the Tyndall effect. So when you see light reflecting off of a fiber in the air, um, that's the Tyndall effect. And so when you see not just clouds, but you know, fibers is kind of lingering in the air for floating. maybe even minutes, floating in the air. Yeah. Um, even those fibers can be deadly. And you sure. can breathe them in. 
Breathe them in. Uh, and women who are using them uh, for their personal hygiene could then develop it. Uh, cancer is the, the uh, I can't remember if it was a uterine cancer. Or ovarian. Yeah. Ovarian cancer. Right. Can you tell us about that? So it is, um, it's been observed over a couple decades that women who use talc have an increased risk of ovarian cancer. And so that's simply just one aspect of the scientific research going into, you know, what causes what, and that's called epidemiology when you have an increased risk. But is there a connection between the two? Absolutely. Okay. It's thought that um, in the talc, well, the reason why, the mechanism of why talc causes these ovarian cancers, it's thought that it's, it could be asbestos because, again, it reaches the endothelial tissue and it causes asbestos in that, or causes cancer in that tissue. It's just a question of if it can reach that tissue and stay there, buy or persist there long enough to cause a cancer. So the caveat is to switch to cornstarch, right? Absolutely. And the darn thing about it is that we've been, we've had that, um, well, th the manufacturers of talc have known that cornstarch corn is an alternative, but they sold the talc anyway. And that's, that's why you see these big awards, because they had a safer product and they sold the dangerous one. And they knew, did they have some knowledge way back when that the talc could be carcinogen, could have asbestos in it? Did are, the manufacturer, the manufacturers. Right. So, yes, they have known and they have been sampling. Well, allegedly been sampling. A lot of it have been lost conveniently. Hmm. Um, the, the, te the test uh, data. And they would test like a gram out of out of hundred tons. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and then they would throw the actual sample away in the trash. Certain manufacturers would, and so they'd sample very very little. And then the way that they sampled was they used um, a microscopy that was not sufficient enough to detect asbestos in there. It would it would detect it at a certain number that was not sensitive enough. And so, yeah, they tested it, but they tested knowing what the result would be. And they even came out with their own standard of testing on their own talc so that the FDA would not regulate them. Chris, how does wow. somebody find when did, out? Well, if well, wait a minute, wait a minute. When all did right, all this happen? Oh, man, uh, 70s and 80s. The whole wow. talc. Back then? Right. The talc. Dang. And it wasn't just the manufacturers um, of baby talc, cosmetic talc. It was industrial talc, too, that was involved in uh, coming up with standards for determining what's the difference between a talc and an asbestos fiber. What is the testing that should be done on talc versus asbestos? All this kind of stuff. So the industrial talc manufacturers and the cosmetic talc manufacturers were both involved in manufacturing a system, setting up a system where they could sell this to human beings in this country um, and not ever be held responsible for selling asbestos. Isn't that people. crazy? We're Larry and Rob Mandel, the brothers-in-law, here on Go Country 105. Do you have a legal issue you need help with? We want to hear from you. Find us on Instagram and send us a message. Then tune in on Saturdays at 8 a.m. right here on Go Country 105. Hey, if you missed any part of this show or you just want to hear it again, go to brothersonlaw.com for all of our previous shows and all things Brothers on Law. So how does somebody find out if they have asbestos exposure? What do they do? Um, finding out if – so if they just have exposure, um, well, then you – you just don't ever be exposed ever again. Well, I, what I mean is if you have a condition, how do you know if it's okay. you know, asbestos? That is, the, that is the tough question. And even doctors don't have sufficient knowledge to know what questions to ask. But without knowing the questions to ask, it's really impossible to do. And that's why guys like me, we specialize in this field, and we put a lot of time in to find out what asbestos is in so we can ask the right questions. I see. Got to ask the right questions. But part of it is uh, recognizing, I take it, the symptoms that people are having. I mean, that kind of goes to his question is like, you know, you're not feeling good or there's something going on, and, um, you know, it may be such a big process of elimination mm -hmm. to figure out, Oh, yeah, it was this talcum powder I was using, you know, for years and years. Or, you know, or I was living in this old rundown house that had, you know, ceiling tiles. Like my house. Had, yeah. Well, but you you got your asbestos removed before you were living in it, right? No. Oh, you were in it? No, I was in it. 
Oh man, you could be in trouble, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll come over, man. Thank Buy you, me Chris. Over. I'll look at it. <laughs> Yeah. But um, that, that's all. That house has been sold. Oh, it's, <laughs> yeah. But, but maybe I won't come over to the yeah. house. But what are the problems that we typically see with people who have had this exposure and then uh, you know get some kind of related uh, issue? So there's a there's a clear cut distinction in the two different types of diseases, and the um, malignant or cancers, the malignant diseases. Um, it starts with the diagnosis. Once you have a diagnosis of cancer, uh, once you have a diagnosis of mesothelioma, then you begin asking the questions of where did the exposure occurred. Right. If you have a non-malignant disease, which is a non-cancerous respiratory illness, something like asbestosis, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, um, COPD, something like that, uh, you have to get x-rays done, uh, you have to get uh, pulmonary function testing done, and once you have a sufficient amount of impairment to give you a diagnosis, then you take that diagnosis and you find out where the exposure has been and how much. So that's how you connect the dots. That's how we connect the dots. And it yeah. goes back to that, was it Ramzini? Ramazzini. 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 Where he's asking you, you know, well, where do you, what kind of work do you do? That's 100% you know, right. Because if you were in the roofing trade or the insulation trade, or uh, drywall or whatever, construction. That's right. Uh, you may have been exposed to asbestos for years and years. That's right? absolutely right. Or if you were, um, well, what other kinds of occupations expose people to these kinds of things? Oh, it's, it's really crazy. Um, cigarette filter makers. Really? Believe it or not, yeah. How the, about cigarette filter users? Cigarette filter users? <laughs> they have some other I've, things I've to worry about. I've tried one of those cases. Those yeah. are very tough cases. Wow. They're the most dangerous consumer product ever made in this country. It's called the uh, the Kent cigarette with the Micronite filter. I remember. Yeah. The, yeah, you know the jingle, don't you? Yeah. yeah. What's the jingle, Kent, Rob? I, I can't remember the jingle, but I, I just remember it. the Kent cigarette with the Micronite filter. Yeah. You know, just like it was, it was, they were really pushing it, like it was the best thing. Well, they obviously pushed it on you, buddy. Yeah, you well, remember I, it. Luckily, I never, <laughs> never got uh, addicted. Yeah, I mean, imagine being exposed to cigarette smoke and chrysidolite asbestos, the deadliest form of asbestos, at the same time over a period of years. Imagine oh my gosh! That. And also Bondo, isn't that another product? So there's talc and Bondo. Yeah, Bondo, which is like an automobile filler for. You know, dents and things like that. So auto body workers. Yeah. Yeah. Stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and of course, brothersonlaw.com. Hey, if you missed any part of this show or you just want to hear it again, go to brothersonlaw.com for all of our previous shows and all things Brothers on Law. Getting back to the uh, Micronite filter for a moment, have you had those cases? You said, I think you said you tr you've tried them. I have. Um, I tried a Kent case um, in San Antonio, Texas after tort reform. And man, it was tough. We had to do a lot of things in Texas that people in other parts of the country didn't have to do that are a very big barrier to asbestos disease victims, which is why I had to leave and a lot of other firms don't Nobody tries cases in Texas anymore. No, Texas um, asbestos cases just not good tried. Oh, because of the, the laws that regulate it. Because of tort reform, right? And you are uh, originally from Texas. You hail from Texas, right? Which is, yes, I am, which is how I got into this. Wow. Because there are so many of these folks that had these kinds of problems from asbestos and whatnot? Right. So my old man was an asbestos worker. Your and, dad? Yeah, my dad yeah. was an asbestos worker. And it's just a, a function of um, where I grew up and you know, uh -huh. who my dad was. That's why I'm here. Now, now, tell us about your dad then. What happened to him as a result? So my dad's name is Larry Medexho, and he's one of, the, uh, one of the first guys to get into asbestos litigation. He, he was an attorney too, right? He became an attorney yeah. after he was an asbestos worker. Wow. Represented a lot of his friends. And seeing his friends die the way that he did, it's a terrible death. Um, it really had a terrible effect on him, and it... Um, it, it it pushed him into, um, well, it was really hard on my dad. And he uh, he uh, he had a, a tough time dealing with it. And, and eventually he couldn't deal with it, just seeing all the, the widows and, the, and the, his friends, the way that they died. It was too yeah, much. It was too much for him eventually, yeah. And you are his legacy, aren't you, Chris? Yep. I'm yeah. I'm the old the old man's son, and I practice a lot with my sister. And she's she's really the tough one. She's the strong one. 
uh, mm. between us, my sister. Kind of like me and Rob, but yeah. Yeah, I'm the tough one. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Angela Modek is my sister's name. But yeah, just like y'all. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. So you, do you do practice with her here in California then? So um, the Modek Show Law Firm has two offices, one in Texas and one in California. And I manage the office here in California, and my sister manages the one in Houston, Texas. Oh, nice. But you're effectively partners then? We are partners. Oh, wonderful. So, Chris, what other kind of toxic tort cases do you handle? Um, I will handle pretty much anything. I've handled uh, benzene exposure cases. We uh, we handle also Roundup exposure cases. What hey, they tell c- us about Roundup. Yeah, Roundup. Yeah. What is that? Well, Roundup is um, well, it's a it it's a weed killer herbicide product manufactured by used to be manufactured by Monsanto. They were bought out by Bayer in 2018, uh, but they're still headquartered in Saint or well, Crevecur, Missouri, which is outside of Saint Louis, Missouri. And um, it's a weed killer product that uh, went generic in, I think, 2003. And so other people are making Roundup-like products with glyphosate in it. And that's the bad stuff? Glyphosate is the active chemical ingredient which causes um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and other lymphomas in, in, uh, in leukemias, yeah. But mainly non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there's been some lawsuits in California regarding Roundup, right? There have been. Yeah, and has there been any jury verdicts in that regard? Yes, there had. There was a jury verdict in San Francisco, um, a very large jury. It was like in excess of two hundred million dollars, uh, punitive damages. Was it someone that was working with this stuff on a regular basis, or just a, a regular Joe who bought it at the Home Depot or whatnot? This particular gentleman, um, whose case was tried in Northern California, worked. Um, Applying Roundup at schools. Okay, so he was that he did it on a regular basis. Yeah, it was his job. But what what about the guy who just wants to kill a few weeds in his driveway, and you get that little squirt bottle, and you're squirting them? You know, are you being exposed on any kind of level that is uh, potentially worrisome? Well, well, is a Roundup still on the market? (laughs) You can go to Home Depot and buy Roundup. Oh yeah, damn. Okay, all right. Go ahead, Chris. Um, it, which so Roundup and Talc are similar in that respect, right? They're still they're still sold. They still have the carcinogen in it, wow. and it's still very very important for human beings to be protected from them. But that goes back to my my question. You know, the, oh, yeah. that you know you got a worker who's using it constantly, and I can see that exposure being uh, tough. But what about the guy who you know every a couple of Sundays a, a a month is just squirting a few weeds in his backyard or is on his driveway? Is that potentially a dangerous exposure? So you get into a very important issue, which is dose, right? Okay. So the dose makes the poison, is what they say, ah. uh, and. If that person just using it on the weekends does it just a few times, then I'm th- I'm sure he's probably fine. But if that person uses it over the weekends over a period of years, not only is that person exposed, but that person's family right. is likely exposed. I have one case right now um, where the wife uh, was around the the husband exposing it, and she developed non Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she has no it right kidding. Now. Well, what can you do to protect yourself? Can you wear a mask? Can you wear gloves? Is it going to help at all? Or does it go through the skin? Well, the, the very first industrial hygiene uh, uh, principle is to remove remove the exposure. So you Don't use weeds. it. Yeah, just don't yeah. Live with your weeds or pluck them. Yeah. Right. You know? And do after, a weed whacker. Yeah. Do weed whackers. Yeah. Right. Um, secondary is um, you use personal protective equipment to minimize the exposure. So remove it and then minimize it. It's basically it. And then after that, you get into ventilation and things like that. But uh, yeah. Now, this chemical that's in Roundup, now, maybe I'm thinking of the old Roundup, but I remember it being 2,4-D. Is it related to 2,4-D? Um, I, I profess ignorance. I don't know. Okay, because the, the old herbicides were 2,4-D, and then the, the original generation was 2,4-5-T, which was Agent Orange that we used horribly in Vietnam to decimate forests and, you know, uh, jungle and whatnot. And it exposed all these veterans, all these uh, soldiers to these um, terrible uh, cancer-causing yeah. chemicals. And, um, and that's what I thought it was a variant of that, but maybe it isn't anymore. I don't know. It may be. I just... I, I likely just don't know enough. I, yeah. I don't know about that. I know more the um, the more recent history of it and how Monsanto kind of 
they tried to seed the literature in their favor and they paid people to ghostwrite articles that were favorable to Monsanto. Mm. And those Imagine a corporate uh, <laughs> corporation doing something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, well, it's time to sh- shift gears a little bit, Rob, and hear our fun fact of the day. Really? Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'll tell you, sunflowers can help clean radioactive soil. Huh. Nice. Japan is so don't use, use too, uh, a Roundup on your sunflowers. Yeah, leave okay. them alone. Japan yeah. is using this to rehabilitate uh, Fukushima. Which is the nuclear plant that yeah. went awry. That's yeah, right. Go ahead Almost 10,000 packets of sunflower seeds have been sold to people in that city. Wow. Hmm. All right, let's grow some sunflowers. They're beautiful. And Van Gogh yeah. painted them, and they're just gorgeous. Yeah, there you go. Hey, guess what, though? Let's hear a true and false, a true or false law. Now, yeah. Chris, this is perfect for you. Yeah. In Texas, in yeah. Texas, Chris, okay. is it legal to sell your eyeballs? <laughs> Rob, say that again. Sell, sell your, your eyeballs. eyeballs. Get it out, Rob. <laughs> is Chris. it legal to sell your eyeballs in Texas? I'm going to go with... I'm dead or alive, with, though. True or false? <laughs> I'm going to go with true it is legal. All right. And what do you... It's, it's false. false. All right, well. You can't sell your your eyes? Wait a minute. Wait <laughs> but a minute. if you're can dead... You, can you <laughs> donate them? Yeah. Well, we don't have an answer to that. Well, I'm, I'm asking the, uh, our, our producer, producer, Cam, and she doesn't seem to know that part. Okay, but we do have a message in our, our message box. Hey, hello, I'm calling from Glendale. My name is Saloma. Uh, I had my hair done at Salon, and I thought I was going to get a nice new color, but they left the bleach in too long and my hair fell out. Uh, do I have... Uh, a case to sue salon well what do i do or or no so um larry what 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 advice would you give to uh saloma there yeah she has a case because we've handled cases like this where there's been a product that's been put on the hair and it's caused baldness it's called scarring and it depends on you know whether or not they should do a patch test first to see if the person's allergic to it and then also they got to make sure they don't mix the wrong chemicals. So yes, I, I believe she has a case. Yeah. Um, let's see if her hair can grow back. I think before she goes, you know, unless it, if she goes to someone and a doctor or someone is saying, "Hey, your hair is never going to grow back," I'd say that's a big case. Yeah. If it's just a temporary thing, I'm not sure she'd want to go through all the stress and terror of litigation over it. So, uh, Chris Medek show. How do someone who has a uh, an exposure, they believe they've been exposed and injured and harmed by uh, toxic chemicals such as asbestos or the chemicals in Roundup, how do they get a hold of you? Well, we get calls all the time, actually. Um, and it's a lot, a lot of them are residential exposure calls, right? So I'll get a call from somebody who lives in their home and, you know, I've, I've gotten calls about kids who are having breathing issues. Um, people who are just scared and they want answers. They want to know what's going on. Right. And so, so how do they find you, Chris? Well, they call my office. What's um, that number? Oh, goodness. Uh, how about your website? Chris doesn't website. know his own number. <laughs> well, I, I 713-910-8000 is our office number. There That's you go. Um, what is that again? 713-910-8000. I wasn't asking you, Rob, but, and how do they get your, how do they get you on the web? They can go to our website at um, medexhowlaw.com, and that's M-A-D like David, E-K, S like Sam, H-O, law.com. All right, all right. Well, it's time to wrap up our show again, Rob, and again, we want to thank Chris for taking his time and coming down here and being so informative about all these possible exposures that we are, you know, possibly going to get so be careful out there (laughs) yeah and we really enjoyed having you on our show chris so and folks if you missed any part of the show and you want to hear it again or you want to listen to any any of our previous shows go to brothersonlaw.com for all things brothers on law also youtube rob also on youtube you can check us out in brothers on law show and to our listeners thank you for tuning in and check out our next week's show at the same time 8 a.m right here on go country 105 And remember, let the scales of justice tip in your favor. The opinions expressed in the Brothers on Law Show are for informational purposes only. 
and are not a substitute for personal professional legal advice.